Okay, this video is going to be a bit of more of an in-depth look at a TikTok I made with various different drug facts. So, jumping right into it, the first drug fact was that MDMA distorts emotional perception of faces by making individuals perceive faces as less angry, less fearful, and less sad. And the study I referenced there didn't actually have significant results for sad faces, but there are a variety of other studies that have found uh, differences for sad faces. So it seems that the effect of MDMA is across all three of those emotions, but this is only seen at higher MDMA doses. I think if I remember correctly, the dose that elicited this effect was... I'll put it on screen right now. Um, so yeah, looking at the study, it's pretty interesting. It actually compared MDMA, methylphenate, and modafinil in healthy subjects nonetheless. And methylphenate and modafinil didn't really seem to affect the perception of emotions in the same way that um, MDMA would. Although methylphenate did increase subjective anxiety and they did uh, minorly, both methylphenate and modafinil, increase the misclassification of emotions as angry. Uh, so you might be thinking, okay, well, how is MDMA doing this? How is it soliciting this effect? And one pretty big theory at the time was that MDMA was soliciting this through oxytocin. Uh, MDMA is known to increase serum levels of oxytocin, and uh, unlike dopamine, serotonin, or adrenaline, oxytocin can cross the blood-brain barrier, and serum levels of oxytocin actually do correlate to cerebral and central levels of oxytocin. So there's a pretty big entry, increase in oxytocin from MDMA, again, uh, similar doses to what they use in this study. And in another study, they looked to compare MDMA to intranasal oxytocin, which uh, intranasal oxytocin is a thing of itself. It's actually quite interesting. There are some studies in autism showing that perhaps it uh, improves uh, sociability in autism. So yeah, they compared the two of them, and with the same battery of tests, uh, do you perceive this face as sad, do you perceive this face as angry, whatever. And uh, it seems that oxytocin was nowhere near as potent as uh, MDMA in, uh, in blunting emotional uh, perception, specifically for negative emotions. So this doesn't discredit completely that MDMA's effects could be at least partially mediated through oxytocin. Uh, and of course, it's just... Uh, it's an association, you can't really pull much more from it. But this definitely doesn't support the theory, and I wouldn't lean or wager too much on the theory that oxytocin is the only mediator of MDMA's pro-social emotional warping effects, uh, especially because MDMA's pharmacology is so complex. I can't really cover it here, partially because I'm not extremely well-versed on it, but there's plenty of people who are, and at least some of MDMA's pharmacology probably revolves around partial agonism uh, and biased uh, releasing agent ratios and getting into certain brain regions and the fact that it's capable of releasing uh, serotonin alongside noradrenaline and dopamine. So it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know really what else to say, but... Uh, Okay, so moving on to fact number two, uh, it was that amphetamine and methylphenate were not always the only stimulant options for ADHD. The cyclazidone derivative known as pemeline was once an approved drug for ADHD. Um, so pemeline's quite interesting. Uh, oh my gosh, I say that way too much. But it was seen as a milder stimulant uh, somewhere between modafinil and methylphenate. It had milder efficacy for ADHD, but it also had considerably less cardiovascular effects than methylphenidate and amphetamine, which made it preferable uh, for certain situations. Uh, being a milder stimulant, it also seemed to have less abuse potential 
um, and it was extremely selective for dopamine. Pemeline had the interesting thing of being on the market for about a decade before a few cases popped up of sudden irreversible liver damage in a handful of children. Now, um, one more nuanced detail here is that from what I can tell in the case reports, there seems to be a link, uh, at least a preliminary one, not statistically significant or whatever, because there were only, I think, 10 case reports in total that were well documented. But there was a link between adding methylphenidate as a adjunct treatment to pemeline treatment and rapid liver failure. There was one case in specific which I had linked in the video and it talks about how this kid was on, well, 14 year old boy was on pemeline for like 16 months and only when methylphenidate was added did rapid liver failure present itself within two months. There's a few other cases that also show this and the one big, big problem with Pemeline, which if you crunch the numbers, you'll find that Pemeline's, I think Pemeline's liver damage rate uh, relating to its dosing is comparable to that of Tylenol um, and some other uh, liver toxic um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs when they're used constantly and in excess. But the problem with uh, Pemeline is one is that it was expected to be dosed every single day but also in some patients it didn't even elevate liver enzymes before it just collapsed their liver and uh, that is big part of the reason it was taken off the market not because of its absolute toxicity but just because the unpredictable nature of it okay so moving on to the third fact uh, the prototypical per nootropic paracetam has shown poor results in enhancing cognition in Alzheimer's and dementia. But it is also one of the most effective treatments for breath-holding spells. Now, I didn't even know breath-holding spells was a thing, but apparently 5% of babies at some point or another will hold their breath pretty intensely to some emotional stimuli, and it can get to the point where their face turns blue. Typically, they're harmless. Um, but it obviously freaks parents out a lot, so there are some treatments for this to prevent it, although it has, in some instances, been severe enough to cause something like apoxia. But anyways, for some reason, paracetam is like 90% effective or something, 80, 70, I think, maybe, effective for this treatment. It's actually much more effective for the treatment of breath-holding spells than it is for senile dementia cognition enhancement, which is crazy because it was literally discovered as the first nootropic, which doesn't mean that it's efficacious, like I have opinions about that. But yeah, kind of uh, cool to think that babies take paracetam and derive more benefit from it than actual senile dementia patients. Okay, fact number four was that the munchies or appetite enhancement associated with THC intake inspired a pharmaceutical company, Sanofi, to make a pharmacological anti-THC to treat obesity. Now, the drug was called Ramonabant and it was an inverse agonist of the CB1 uh, receptor. Now, inverse agonist just means that it elicits the opposite effect of a traditional agonist, although things usually get more complex because a lot of different agonists that are considered traditional agonists can have minor effects. They're minorly biased in their actions uh, towards certain transcriptional cascades over others. But anyways, um, it did work. Ramonaband did cause people to eat less food, but uh, it also caused psychiatric disturbance in about a third of patients. Um, I can't say the word, but four patients in the Ramonaband group of a study that I think involved about a thousand patients decided to give up, and I mean properly give up. 
whereas only one in the control placebo group uh, did that. Those results are not statistically significant because it's such a small number, but the psychiatric disturbance part was, and it's kind of clear that at least these three patient, this three-patient difference was probably due to Ramonabant. Later on, though, Ramonabant was found to be a nanomolar, a mid-nanomolar um, substrate. Now, the mu opioid receptor is implicated in euphoric effects associated with drug, well, traditional and atypical opioids, such as morphine or tianeptine or metrogynine from Kratom. So it's almost uh, casting doubt on the theory that CB1 inverse agonism was central to its psychiatric disturbance effects simply because mu opioid antagonism to such a degree is documented to cause psychiatric disturbance. But obviously this was never verified because why would you introduce the drug again when it's been very clear that in clinical trials it's not producing favorable uh, results in relation to psychiatric side effects. So fact number five is something that I didn't actually include in the video. Uh, maybe I might make a video on its own about it, but it was because I thought I would get censored by TikTok for talking about it. Anyways, it's uh, the fact that melanocortin receptors, at least some of them, I think it's melanocortin 2. Okay, I lied. Apparently, it's actually melanocortin 4. So, replace every instance of melanocortin 2 with melanocortin 4. Makes people horny, or it causes antidepressant effects, based on whether it's agonized or antagonized. Now, the, the evidence for the antagonization causing antidepressant effects isn't so clear. Uh, Samax is supposed to be an antagonist, or at least has been shown in at least one study, of the melanocortin 2 receptor, and this is implicated in its pro-BDNF effects and antidepressant mechanism. But the agonist, uh, known as PT-141, or or uh, bromelanitan is actually used to treat hyposexuality in uh, women, pre-menopausal women. Uh, for some reason, hitting the melanocortin receptor just makes people very horny. <laughs> it also makes people nauseous, and if it's a drug like bromelanitan is taken long enough, it will actually cause someone to tan uh, at least at a faster rate in the sun. And it seems to be used recreationally for this purpose, but it's never been indicated for that reason. Okay, this last fact. So yeah, that's the end of the video. Um, looking to expand the scope of this channel with stuff like this, but as you can tell, I'm pretty new to it. So in the meantime, put your criticisms or whatever down below, and I'll be sure to look at them. I usually look at most comments, be them on the TikTok or on YouTube or whatever. Do your research and stay safe. Bye.